What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and this is part 40 of my reviewing and then ranking the Grateful Dead's Dave's Picks, the archive concert release series. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, volume 40. That's why this is part 40. Um, and then I will show where it falls among the other 39 I've already talked about, um, which will give you a sense of uh, what I think about this show. Um, though I will say as a caveat, they're, all the Dave's picks are good. The ones at the back, 71 and 78 shows, more has to do with the fact that they're just good, but from eras that aren't my favorite, but a fantastic release series. Uh, volume 40 is two complete shows from Deer Creek um, in Noblesville, Indiana, right outside Indianapolis. Um, I don't know why this venue seems magical. Um, saw them there, a bunch of summer shows. Um, and it's really just an amphitheater in the middle of like a giant parking lot. But it just, I don't know, it felt something like there was something really special about these shows. Like my memory of it is, and I might be wrong, but the amphitheater literally was in the middle of the parking lot. And maybe just like the vibes from the parking lot scene, because in the 90, in 90, the, the parking lot scene was huge. Um, it just seems like maybe all those vibes just fed into the amphitheater like all day. And so the shows were incredible. Um, Kind of a end of an era right here. Um, after this, the dead would go to Tinsley Park, uh, just south of Chicago, for the last three shows that Brent Midland would play with the band um, before he passed away, um, what, eight days after this? But yeah, so like, you know, on the 26th, these shows are from July 18th and 19th of 1990. So you're literally hearing two of the very last shows that Brent Midland ever played. Um, so for, for that reason, it's a good release. But... This is just musically a really strong, I think, sample of what the dead were doing in 90. 90 was a fantastic year. Um, prior, even I mean, uh, the in the Brent era, you know, everything before this, there was the end of 89 and 90, the dead were just like at an all time high. Um, and I think part of like, for those of us so in the scene um, at this point, um, Brent's death was quite a shock. Um, after the Chicago shows, we drove home. It took us like a week to get home. And uh, Brent passed away while we were on the road. And this was 90. We didn't have cell phones. We weren't checking the news. Like we were off the grid as much as possible. And um, I think we we're actually on the night of the 26th. We were on a, uh, we were camping on the abandoned um, uh, ski ramp in Steamboat Springs. Yeah, enjoying, enjoying the view. Um, so we didn't find out until uh, later. And the way I found out was horrible. I think I told that story on another video. Uh, but anyways, this was the end of an era. And these shows do a really good job of capturing what the dead were doing so well on all fronts. Um, the set list is strong. The playing is strong. The energy is strong. Brent's playing is strong. Um, it really is kind of a surprise that, you know, kind of sad that it happened the way it did. But anyways, you got two shows. Um, they both fit on two discs. Uh, so the first disc starts off with the July 18th, 1990 show, opens up with the helps that Franklin's. Um, Jerry seems a little behind on the help, like he's that solo, like he's just, like he's a step behind. But by the time we get to Slip, I think Jerry feels like he's almost in the same place, but because Slip is more open-ended and exploratory, the band almost like steps behind Jerry and it's like, okay, Jerry, that will just kind of let you lead the way. But Jerry seems a little like lagging early um, and the band fix it in Slipknot. And so it's a pretty interesting Slipknot jam. It's too short, just feels way too short, um, but it's still good. It's nice to hear it helps the Franklins open a show. And then the Franklins is a high energy, good time, uh, you know, Deer Creek's rocking by this point. Jerry's a little more in the pocket, a little more in the groove by this point. Um, rest of the first set, you got a New Minglewood Blues. Um, uh, uh, Brent's Easy to Love You. Um, don't like the sound of the keys on this. The keys aren't very, aren't very ear friendly. Um, but, you know, I think one of Brent's better songs. And always fun to hear Peggy O, uh, Masterpiece, a Brown Eyed Women, a pretty good Cassidy, a pretty nice out there. Let's did not drop a little jam in here, kind of a little space going out there action before the end of the first set. And then we get a really rocking deal that just kind of goes on and on and on and everybody's having a good time. And like, uh, when I think of 90, um, I saw a lot of shows in 90. I think two songs that sort of reached their sort of live peak, I think Deal 
was at its monstrous best in 90. Just those Jerry just playing and playing and going off at the end of the first set. And I think Jack Straw also sort of reached its monstrous sort of, it became like a really strong show opener and got a little muscle. And I think, I always think of 90. I think of those two songs as two songs that really just came came into their own in the best way possible. Uh, so we get a deal to close the, uh, the first set. Uh, we get the first two songs of the second set. We get a China Cat Sunflower and I Know You Writer. The China has some really good flavors in it. Midland is providing some really good counterpoint to what Jerry and Bob are doing. Some really good energy in the China Cat Sunflower. Um, yeah, just such a reliable song at this point in their career. Uh, we get a Looks Like Rain that has some really fun trilling at the end of it. Jerry's really going off. And then we get a Terrapin Station which just that pre-inspiration jam after Lady with a Fan before they go into inspiration really goes some kind of interesting places and the textures there are pretty nice. Uh, after the sort of Terrapin Station part, when we get to the da dun da 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 that part, they're really playing this hard and working it and they kind of ride that for a while and then we get sort of a post-Terrapin jam for a while in which sort of different people are leading the charge. I think Phil gets a little time to shine and then Jerry and then Brent even steps up and does some work and we kind of, that kind of goes on for about five minutes. It's like a definitive improv space before between the end of Terrapin and drums. Then everybody eventually leaves and drums is pretty low key, kind of simmering for a while. Um, we go into a space that has lot, lots of MIDI effects um, and we get a really strong the other one tease relatively early in the space. And it's clear that other one is in the air and it's, you know, somebody's feeling like the other one. And then it just kind of bubbles and we're definitely like, oh, this, we're going into the other one. Like you can feel it. Like everybody's toying with the other one feels like it's happening. And then there's only two songs after space, uh, but those two songs take 25 minutes long. And one of them is a 12 and a half minute, the other one, which at this stage in their career is pretty long for the other one. And they're toying with that other one energy and you know, it's coming. And sure enough, Phil hits it and we are off. And like the energy is high. The, I mean, it is, it feels like it is nothing but pure momentum in that middle jam. Like everybody is just pushing it and pushing it. And it really feels like it's just going to fall apart. It almost feels like the dead rarely seem to go this hard in 90, at least my, my recollection. And it just seems like the amount of energy and force with which they're attacking this, the other one, they're not going to be able to keep it together at this point. Like it's just going to fall apart. It's going to just like disintegrate in space. This is just one of those like, like I kind of think of the, the cover of Deep Purple's Fireball. Like that's this song. It is just this fireball raging through space. Um, even uh, Healy at the board is like tweaking the vocals and we get some like, production effects coming in where things are being manipulated sound wise to just further like make this sort of like psych nightmare that's going on like the bus came by and i got on and that's when it all where it all began like this is like some deep deep psych stuff it is one of the best other ones like they've released um especially considering it comes from 90. after the second verse they kind of kind of bring it down they kind of like let things go back to a pretty low simmer and they kind of, there were two ways to do this. Take that energy and ride it hard and deliver like anthemic or let it simmer down and kind of come in a little understated and maybe take the energy, but like subdue it for as long as possible and channel it into like something else. And that's what they do. It's a morning do. And like, they don't hit it hard. They really come in like, oh yeah, we're going to do this morning do. We're going to bring things back down. We know the energy's here. We hear you. We just went through that other one just like you did. But wait till we get to the solo. Wait till we get to the solo. Jerry's going to bring it in the solo. Middle solo, ending solo. Phil's going to get some really good bass runs in there to make sure things are just next level also. Like this is a morning do for the ages. Obviously, it's not a Barton Hall morning do. Um, but that's like, you know, that's pedestal level, right? That's like iconic. That's like you know, Plato's Cave type thing. But we get like a 13 minute morning do in like 1990 after a 12 and a half minute, the other one. Like the dead are like, they are like, 
the future is bright and they need to wear shades. Like they are going hard. Like this is like 25 minutes of some of the best music the dead played in 1990. And it's right here, Deer Creek. Morning Dew ends the set. And then we get The Weight, the band's cover of the band's The Weight for an encore. Fantastic choice. Um, disc three, uh, set uh, to July 19th, 1990 show. First set opens up with a Jack Straw. Uh, like I was talking about earlier, I think 90 was Jack Straw fully came into its muscular opening self and could set up a show for some really good energy. Uh, we get a They Love Each Other to follow. A really nice Desolation Row. I really like this Desolation Row. It's got good energy. Um, a Row Jimmy, which back in the day at this actu actual show, to me, the idea of a row Jimmy following a des desolation row is like, uh, we're just like sinking down into this like mire of like slow songs. But no, the row Jimmy is beautiful. It's fantastic. Jerry's bringing it. I'm all about this. It's exactly where we need to be in the middle of this set. Um, we get a Picasso Moon. I like Picasso Moon. Uh, wasn't a fan of it. Every once in a while, Bob would like open up a second set with it, which I thought was a mistake. But in the middle of the first set, I think it's a fun little song. And, you know, it's Bobby and silly, some silly lyrics. Uh, we get an Althea, always up for an Althea, fantastic Althea. Um, and then things kind of end maybe a little abruptly. We get a Promised Land closer. So it would have been a good place for like a music never stopped or let it grow or, yeah, one of those two. Uh, but we get a Promised Land, a really high energy, really good Promised Land. Uh, but we get a Promised Land uh, to close out. Um, so anyways, um, that's what we get for the first set. Strong first set, uh, but... Second set is one of my favorite second sets of like, of, of 90. Um, just because two of my favorite songs, which I just can't get enough of. I know people did not like them at the time, one of them in particular, but it opens up with a victim or the crime. And this is just absolutely one of the best victim or the crimes. There are longer ones, there are darker ones, but this one is long enough to satisfy. It's dark enough to satisfy. That ending gets all weirdy and noisy and in the moment, if you're there in the venue and this song is going and they're just making all this evil chaotic noise, it, it's awesomely overwhelming in the best way possible. Um, and then after they do that, they kind of briefly return. They, they put you in like sort of like, this is sort of a cousin to the other one energy. Only this is darker and more unsettling. And there's not really a one that you can maybe focus on and put your foot on. It just feels, it just feels all over the place. Um, and then that goes into Foolish Heart. And the fact that Victim of the Crime and Foolish Heart were paired up together so often in this era gives to me, it gives Foolish Heart a darker energy about it that I think works really, really well. Um, beautiful middle solo in this. Jerry is really going out there. It's just absolutely beautiful. All of Jerry's playing in this is absolutely beautiful. Foolish Heart is one of those songs that I just, I don't think gets enough love. It just, it's, it's a, it was a really, really good song. Um, and the victim foolish to open up the second set is fantastic. But that closes out disc three. Disc four, we get a plane in the band. Pretty straightforward playing in the band. Like it's your 90s. Phil's going forward. Jerry's going forward. Everybody kind of supporting them. It's just your like 90s playing in the band, like psychedelic improv exploration. It's exactly what you would expect from playing in the band. But that's good. Love me some playing in the bands. Um, we kind of bring things down for the end of that. Uh, once the jam gets over, we kind of bring things down and we get absolutely, like I can hear this every show, we get a China doll. And the way China Doll just kind of delicately just kind of like plucks itself into existence. And next thing you know, we're in a China Doll. Like just absolutely beautiful. Awesome choice. And then what might be like, at this point, I think most people are expecting like drums, right? The Victim Foolish, that was like 18 minutes long. Then we get a 10 minute playing in the bands. We're at 28 minutes now, right? We got a China Doll. So we're only at about 35 minutes, but... You know, sometimes you got even shorter things than that. But we get an Uncle John's band. And this Uncle John's band, that middle solo in Uncle, or the first solo in Uncle John's band, like it rivals the one, there's a Dick's Picks. I think it's volume six from Dick's Picks. 
which has that, no, volume five from Dick's Picks, which has this absolutely amazing Uncle John's band uh, that's just like soaring and lyrical and melodical. And this one isn't quite as epic as that one, but this one is up there. And then when they get to that second jam, the, that one where they were repeating that vamp, that one just goes out there and gets kind of spacey and they really push that. This is an Uncle John's band for the ages. Like, this is like some absolutely just amazing stuff. Um, that goes into a pretty low key and then really electronic and then really kind of crazy all over the place drums. I want to say there's even like some like what sound like machine gun shots at some point. Space is all like Danny Elfman whimsical and weird and psychedelic like poppy and all kind of just quirky. Um, and then after out of space, we get an all along the watchtower. Uh, we get a Black Peter with has a which has a lot of bounce to it. This is a this is a bouncy Black Peter. Like this is this is a long. We've come a long way from those like heart wrenching like versions from like seventy and seventy one. Like this is a bouncing. There's some there's some energy in this Black Peter. It's a pretty good like post Jerry Space song. Um, and then we get a not fade away. That is fantastic. That jam and not fade away. Jerry has this moment where he just keeps keeps repeating these like same like I think it's like this descending riff. Just he just repeats it over and over and just keeps walking it down and it just provides this really interesting energy that like this the Uncle John's band the sort of other one morning do from the previous show, like the band are really, really feeling themselves in these two shows and they're pushing things farther than they would. And there's definitely more of like a early 70s, let's just keep playing, it doesn't matter what we normally do type five to a lot of what's going on here. Um, the US Blues Encore is not on here. Uh, that's the only thing lacking from these two shows. It is a uh, bonus track on the following release. Um, so I will talk about that then. But yeah, this is a fantastic, fantastic pair of shows. Like it is a a perfect example of what the dead were doing in 90. Like a really good version. Like, again, you got some standard stuff, like things like Slipknot, Franklin's aren't really as out there as they were in the 70s. But then you got stuff like the other one, the Morning Dew, the Uncle John's Band, even that Terrapin, where they're really just like, Still really, really pushing the envelope and doing some fantastic things here in 90. Um, where would I rank it? I have it pretty high. It's all the way up there at number 13. Couldn't quite get it above number 12, but I do think it's better overall than that volume 31. So I think there are some of the other ones, you know, from like 14 all the way through 30, where maybe there was a single performance or a pair of songs, which are maybe more must hears than a lot of the stuff on here. But this show is so consistently good. Uh, Midland sounds fantastic. His, his keyboard work is fantastic. Other than the cheesy sounding keys and easy to love you, his contributions are fantastic. The band sounds amazing. You know, so it's kind of heartbreaking knowing that they'd have three more shows and then that would be it uh, for this version, you know, without Brent Midland around. But anyways, this is a great love letter to him. I mean, he's not the star of the show, but... He's in a band that's absolutely, absolutely bringing it. So anyways, yeah, that's all I got. Let me know what you think of this show. Let me know what you think of the dead in general, um, all that kind of stuff. Comment, subscribe. And if you haven't heard this man, I know it's it's gotta be out there somewhere, right? On the internets, go listen to it. Listen to the, just listen to the set twos. The set ones are fantastic, but the set twos just have some absolutely magical moments. But yeah, check these out. It, they're good. They're good. That's all I got. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, share, all that other stuff. And go listen to some Grateful Dead. Go listen to some Grateful Dead. Peace. Talk to you later.